John Verveke and Sean Coyne have together authored a new book, Mentoring the Machines. It's a book about artificial intelligence and the path forward that further develops the arguments of how to align artificial intelligence to human flourishing, and it sets those arguments into beautiful and accessible writing. Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Verveke. I'm very excited uh, to have John Stewart back again. This is thir his third time. Um, and there's been this increasing progression of ideas and interest in our discussions. Um, and so John has something in particular he wants to focus in on uh, for today. And so uh, welcome, John. It's great to have you here again. It's great to be with you again, John. Um, I was particularly looking forward to, the, to this discussion because central to the evolutionary worldview and, and my life as well um, is the development of technologies um, that enhance human capacities, uh, particularly cognition and social emotional um, mm -hmm. capacities. Um, so the, the evolutionary worldview, as, as we've discussed before, um, identifies a trajectory to evolution, mm -hmm. um, predicts the, you know, the, the next major evolutionary transitions which need to occur uh, in life on Earth, and in particular, uh, the hatching of a global superorganism, a unified, cooperative, mm. sustainable, and highly evolvable uh, planetary society uh, that becomes an entity in its own right and evolves in its own right. Mm. Um, and basically, that, that transition is needed if humanity is to survive the existential threats that currently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are the basis. So the, the question is what capacities do we need, do each of us need individually and collectively yes. in order to drive that process forward and successfully uh, you know, take the next step, step in evolution? Because if, if, if humanity and life on Earth uh, isn't aligned with the tra trajectory of evolution, it's selected out of existence. I mean, that's the definition of a, a trajectory. A trajectory identifies, uh, in effect, what, what is needed to survive and thrive. Um, so it identifies what's needed to overcome the existential threats. The existential threats are the select selection processes. Right. At this stage in the evolution of, uh, of life, um, mean that if, if we if we don't proceed to, be, to establish a unified and cooperative global uh, society, uh, then the existential threats will, will win and select us out of existence. Mm. And those, those threats, for example, are you know, environmental destruction, of which climate change is, um, destructive climate change is, is first and foremost. Uh, the threat of nuclear war, you know, which um, <laughs> was very, very big, uh, very recognised, uh, you know, in the 60s where a million people, uh, you know, marched in uh, the UK, uh, led by Bertrand Russell, the great English philosopher, um, against, uh, you know, nuclear pr proliferation. Um, and we've been on the brink of nuclear extinction a number of times. It's just one, basically, that's got us through it. So, so that's, that's another key existential threat. So what capacities do we need to, um, um, you know, does an evolutionary activist need? Mm -hmm. An mm -hmm. evolutionary activist is, is someone who is uh, trying to drive the process forward because we, we, we live in an extraordinary evolutionary process. It's a developmental process. You can see the, you know, the history of the evolution of life on Earth. It's a developmental process leading to the hatching of the global superorganism. Um, so it's a developmental process, just like an embryo developing within a chicken egg mm. that it eventually hatches a, a chicken. Uh, but the extraordinary thing about the, the nature of this developmental process that we're embedded in is that uh, the, that it only completes successfully if the key intelligent organisms involved, that's humans, wake up to the fact that they're in an evolutionary developmental process and see where it needs to go and see is that we have a role in driving the process forward. It's only, it's only if we wake up to the process, see where it needs to go. Uh, it's, it's as if you're in a chicken egg and you're a cell within a chicken egg 
then you eventually realize you're part of the developmental process. And then you come to the extraordinary realization that that process will only complete successfully, it'll only hatch uh, <coughs> if you and other cells wake up to the nature of the process you're embedded in, see what your role is to drive it forward and then do that. So what capacities are needed for that? It's, it's, it's central to you know, being an evolutionary activist or acting on the evolutionary worldview. It's central to that is developing the capacities needed to uh, wake up to the nature of the, you know, the large scale evolutionary processes in which you're embedded and driving that forward. So to, to make it more concrete, what, what capacities do we need to develop individually and collectively in order to um, mm -hmm. overcome the existential threats that currently face humanity. Mm -hmm. so, so a major, you know, interest in my life from, you know, from a, a teenager um, has been the identification of those practices, uh, the technologising of those practices. Mm -hmm. uh, so taking from wherever they exist on this planet, in whatever religious or contemplative tradition they're embedded, taking taking the practices from those, um, developing a cognitive science uh, model of those practices and why they work, which is sort of the you know that that's was the great step forward that started 400 or so years ago when with the uh, emergence of technology and industry, industrialization and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's taking the folk knowledge, developing cognitive science models, and then using those cognitive science models to then tune, adapt, uh, develop, mm -hmm. uh, enhance processes uh, that will eventually, uh, just as industrialization produced scientific knowledge that, you know, is almost unrecognisable from the folk knowledge that it emerged from. The these technologised practices will look almost nothing like the uh, spiritual and contemplative traditions from which they came. Wow, that's that's a powerful claim. That last one, I find that very 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 interesting. Um, so there's kind of something like an exaptation out of these traditions to something that's a, a, an evolutionary step. Um, what, what would that look like? Like, what, what specifically would that look like? Um, well, the, you know, to relate it to your work, as I understand your work, and, I, and I've been stalking you recently in the sense, <laughs> 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 in the sense that I've been, you know, uh, watching closely your, your recent discussions with Ian McGilchrist, for example, your discussion with Lex Fridman, yeah. and uh, the video that came out of the, uh, uh, you know, the retreat, um, yep. Yep. so on, which, which was about developing a curriculum for wisdom. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. They're all, that's, you know, they're all aligned with this. Uh, well, they're all aligned with the spirit underlying your project and, and, you know, what I would claim is the evolutionary activist project. Right. Absolutely aligned, but the detail, um, the detail differs. Um, so the um, so the, the first thing that gets sorted out is, in my view, in developing any technologies of practice, is to identify what the goals are. Mm -hmm. you know, what is it? What are the capacities you're trying to build, and for what purpose? Mm -hmm. um, it's almost impossible to develop a you know an integrated suite of technologies if you if you haven't got a clear uh, idea of, of what purposes they're meant to serve. Mm -hmm. So in but in the evolutionary perspective, it's it's reasonably straightforward. Um, basically, you need the cognitive capacity to build mental models of future evolution and the trajectory of evolution, and you use those cognitive models to to see what we have to do to align with those trajectory trajectories mm -hmm. and overcome the existential threats. So you. You basically, you know, you need strategic cognitive capacity, the ability to develop complex strategies in complex circumstances. Uh, as I've used it before in our discussion, second enlightenment cognition, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to the limited first enlightenment cognition, which can't adequately cognize complexity. 
So you need strategies. Secondly, you then need, you know, and this seems trivial in a way, but given the human condition, it's not, it's absolutely central. Um, it's you need individuals individually and collectively the ability to implement those strategies, mm -hmm. to take the actions, to take the actions that are identified by those strategies. Um, and basically that means that, that you know, if, if you're, if individually, you know, well, where we are now in general, where humanity is, is in general, is generally psychologically, we do not choose our likes and dislikes. We cannot, uh, you know, change our genetically, so, uh, socially and culturally uh, implanted uh, motivations, desires, goals, and so on. Uh, that's the nature of, of a current human being. Um, we can't, we don't choose our likes and dislikes. Therefore, our likes and dislikes, our, our inherited socialised and conditioned impulses and motivations might conflict with what we need to do in order to mm -hmm. implement complex strategies needed to Need, that are needed to take the next great steps in evolution on Earth. So, making it more concrete individually, you know, it's it's the as an evolutionary activist, um, or you know, to not sort of embed it in, in the evolutionary world, but just to be, just to act uh, optimally and skillfully to assist in the overcoming of the, of the existential threats that face humanity. Um, you need to be able to align your personal motivations, your personal personal conditioning, and so on, with the actions needed to to optimally you know, overcome those existential threats. Um, so, you know, to become an activist and an effective activist might involve might involve you doing things that are you know violate your inherited moral predispositions, the pro-social. You know, some of the pro-social predispositions that are implanted in humanity in our tribal stage. Uh, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's because it's, it's, you know, to an extent, the, mean, the ends justify the means. The question is, how can you ensure that you're not uh, handicapped in your, in your activism by predispositions that aren't aligned with, the, with what you need to do? That come from your conditioning, your socialization, and your genetic inheritance. So, so that's they're the two capacities you need. You know, the complex cognition, the ability to become self-evolving in the sense that you you can <coughs> change your motivations and, and so on. And the so then the they become the measuring sticks that you use to uh, develop practices and to develop cognitive science models and so on. Could you give could you give a more specific example? I, I, I could hear I'll, I'll run this one point. I could hear people being worried about sort of overcoming our our, our pro-social inborn tendencies um, and, and you know the ends justify the means has been uh, the, the, the the clarion call of many bloodthirsty regimes and utopias. Um, so what, what would that mean? Like, can you be specific on that, that point? Yeah. So, well, to give an example, so say, say that you're, uh, you know, imagine, uh, being a, a single cell, uh, organism, free living, uh, you know, in, at, the, at that evolutionary time where that was the most complex form of, of life existing on the planet. Um, and then imagine that, you know, that you and your other freedom in single cells developed intelligence and you had the capacity to, to you know, sit around a table, so to speak, and plan how you would evolve in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, obviously totally hypothetical and, and not realistic, but it, it's, it's designed to make a particular point. Um, so if those cells, you know, discuss their evolutionary future um, and discuss what they would need to do to, to be successful in evolutionary 
terms in the future. And if their, their science was good enough, they'd see, well, they needed that, that, the, um, that the leading tip of evolution involved forming collectives of, of mm. cells. Right. Uh, in other words, giving, giving rise to uh, multicellular organisms. And then the long trajectory of the, you know, the multicellular organism becoming an agent in its own right and developing the mm. you know, evolve as, and adapt as a coherent whole. So the, now you could easily imagine that such a proposition that we, we our, our, our intelligent selves, should give up our free living life, uh, you know, where we pseudopodia our way around our, you know, uh, warm little ponds and, and live the good life, we should give that up and form these collectives where we're, we're not free any longer, you know, we're, we're attached to other selves, um, we're constrained and we, we basically live with, with the, uh, you know, with the, in each other's excreta, so to speak, you know, so it's yeah. images like, a, you know, the emergence of the first cities, which weren't a pretty sight, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, so the those those single cells, uh, you know, if they made their decision about how they were going to evolve in the future, uh, based on how they felt about it, you know, so if they if they tasted those possibilities, <laughs> tasted that possibility um, by consulting their feelings, you know, their, their uh, inherited predispositions and their motiva their existing motivations and so on, then, uh, you know, you can imagine them deciding, no, we don't want that. You know, that's not the way we want to be. So similarly, similarly with um, humanity. So our pro-social impulses, the, the, the enculturated ones and the genetic ones, largely come from the tribal phase and in human societies, where tribes competed with one another and there were large populations of tribes. And mm -hmm. so you could, you could get the natural selection competitive dynamic going. And the, the tribes that were the most coherent socially tended to be the ones who were uh, selected by, by evolution. And the predispositions of, of members of the tribe that caused them to be the most coherent socially that is pro-social predispositions tended to be favoured by evolution. So the, however, what's pro-social uh, in those circumstances in tribal societies might be utterly different from what's pro-social when we need to make the move to a... I, I see, I see, I see. So you're saying our pro-social inclinations and, and predispositions um, basically evolved within... Uh, 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 within a tribal scale, at a tribal scale, and that is not the scale we need to be working at now if we're going to uh, pick up on the evolutionary gradient towards entification. Uh, that what we need in order to create the kind of agency that can save us from the existential risks. Did I? Is that is that getting it correctly? Perfectly. That's that's perfect. So, and just to, just to give a concrete example. In tribal societies, group punishment uh, is a critically important uh, pro-social mechanism. So, the, and and we feel that in our everyday lives at the at the tribal level, you know, the group will turn on individuals that breach the norms of the tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that was essential to enforcing the norms. Right, right, right. So, so the pro-social impulses aren't necessarily, you know, the ones that are that are highly developed. You know, American spiritual progressive might intuit as being, you know, the the you know good value, good values and and so on. So um, the you know good so you know group punishment, uh, gossip, uh, group censure, uh, and and more particularly the one that's extremely dangerous still in the, in the world today is in group versus out group. So the, yeah. the yes yes yes. So you, so, and that's, you know, which is underpins racism and so on. Yes. And, and racist tendencies are now being harvested by, harvested by you know, um, uh, pro-capitalist political parties in America, uh, UK, Australia, but 
presumably in Canada as, as well. In other words, the, you know, the, the wealthy and powerful, they have to, to maintain their power, they've got to pull off the trick of getting 50% of the people in a modern democracy to vote yeah. for the interest of the powerful rather than their own mm -hmm. yeah. personal interests. And part of the way you do that is by fueling you know, racist sentiments uh, having an enemy from the outside, internal enemies that you, you know, and so on and so on. That, that you know. No, I think uh, that's that, that's a well placed example, and there's a record of a historical record of that. It was especially the case during the Gilded Age, and many people are are saying that that's happening right now as well. I'm wondering if you could say the op, like, what's the opposite? What are the tendencies within us now? The proclivities, or the, the capacities that are present that we can build upon or draw upon exact from that are taking us in the, the direction that you're proposing okay well well it's it's very very aligned with how i understand you know some of the the goals of your practices so mm -hmm. so waking up waking up for example you know using yeah 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 up is basically develops the capacity to be able to uh Move, move through. Well, waking up in the midst of ordinary life involves the ability to move through the world uh, and not be captured by and driven by you know the inherited predispositions, your conditioning, and so on. But instead, mm. Uh, mm. where where an emotion is evoked by circumstances, and that emotion is not consistent with what you need to do to be an effective actor in the world, an effective agent in the world, then you. Uh, you know, you, you have psychological distance from that emotion, that conditioning. You can stand back from it. You know, you can use various metaphors for this. And that's why you know, the, the next step is then to develop a cognitive science that does mm -hmm. away with the metaphors and, and, you know, deals in what in cybernetic terms and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with how waking up achieves this psychological distancing, what, right. what is it? Yeah. yeah. In, Biological terms, and that then enables you to to um, hone in on you know how you, how you can use existing practices of waking up to to develop more uh, you know better practices, more effective practices, ones that act more quickly, and so on. So the um, uh, the so that that's yeah so that's the example I'm giving of. Uh, you know, so waking up is a, is a specific capacity that is is a specific concrete example of what I'm talking about uh, in terms of being able to uh, you know move at right angles to your predispositions. It's it's the it's the, the classic capacity that enables you to move at right angles to uh, your conditioned predispositions, your genetic predispositions, and so on. Uh, and you need that capacity to move at right angles in order to do whatever is needed for future future evolution. Um, on the question of specifically what does it mean, you know, in detail, well, to, to work that out, you have to have a, you know, that's why you need the cognition. Yeah. That's, yeah. Cognition is central to this because you need to be able to see what the evolutionary demands are now and in the future. You need that look, at, look ahead capacity to be able to say, well, um, you know, we need to move to a, uh, you know, an integrated cooperative global society. And that entails us reorganising our political and social systems in these particular ways. And that, that involves me and others, other evolutionary activists, behaving in particular ways and being able to act in particular ways in particular circumstances. So, that, so and I, I think it's... It's worth mentioning. You know, we touched on this briefly in a previous discussion, but but there's this this there's this three phase, arguably this three three phase transition uh, underway that we're embedded in um, at the moment that humanity has, where we're initially uh, you know two hundred thousand or more years ago, uh, the, there was there was there wasn't any detailed thinking capacity that enabled planning ahead. Mm -hmm. that enable envisaging future circumstances and taking that into account to work out how we should adapt here and now. There mm -hmm. wasn't that book capacity. There wasn't the declarative knowledge or the propositional knowledge or the you know, thinking capacity to do that. Um, 
and and so so evolution to personify it, uh, evolution had no option but to install in us and enforce through group punishment, you know, the kinds of predispositions that led to the behaviours that that led to uh, that which was uh, successful in evolution terms. In other words, you know, organising tribal societies, the pro-social impulses and so on. We didn't choose them. We didn't think through them. The, you know, the human beings that existed at the time couldn't form the mental models that enable them to outdo evolution uh, and and see, you know, the detailed behaviours and actions that were required. And then came the fall. You know, and the fall was the eating of the fruit from the tree of knowledge, which was the emergence of, you know, propositional knowledge, thinking, mm -hmm. ahead and so on. Um, and that... Uh, Eventually, that developed, you know, into uh, analytical rational thought, first enlightenment thinking, and it it's it thought it had the capacity to think through afresh, you know, these predispositions and and so on, mm -hmm. uh, and it threw them out. It killed God, you know. Mm -hmm. and that was what the nature of part was, as you point out, was you know, warning against you've killed God, but. You've therefore thrown out everything that came with God, which mm -hmm. was all those rules and so on mm -hmm. that your primitive thinking mind couldn't understand, uh, and therefore just threw out with God because they're embedded in, you know, in religious language and justification, dependent on supernatural stories and myths for their, uh, for their adoption and their perpetuation and their reproduction in society and in culture. So... So that was the second part of the phase was, you know, uh, thinking, which which had enormous benefits in terms of industrialisation and so on, but great disadvantage in the sense that it killed God and killed the wisdom, mm -hmm. you know, the evolutionary wisdom. Uh, and and that's that's why the sacred exists. So so part of, you know, this is another thing that, you know, that people would initially react to negatively to, I think, is that, you know, I basically say, well, you know, the development of these technologies, the development of a cognitive science, the development of these enhanced practices that look nothing like the traditions that initially, you know, had the spark in them that is taken and then developed. Um, the, uh, the, that process involves uh, disregarding the sacred or not treating you know, this wisdom is um, as sacred eventually. And part of the reason for, you know, seeing, seeing a pro having a problem with that is that the sacred was, a, was the way of protecting uh, the, uh, predis the tribal predispositions often embedded in religion and the mm -hmm. supernatural, protecting them from being, uh, you know, undermining their ignorance uh, by uh, individ individuals playing with them, uh, changing them, not knowing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So the you know, importance of the sacred, somewhat paradoxically, was demonstrated by um, the uh, by the fact that the rise of first enlightenment analytical rational cognition, you know, uh, undid that which the sacred initially was mm -hmm. uh, was adaptation cultural adaptation mm -hmm. uh, that protected this wisdom. So now the, so the, that brings us to the third stage, and the third stage is the, the emergence of cognition that can do justice to the complexity involved mm -hmm. in seeing how to organise societies uh, and seeing how we take this next step towards a global identification and so on. So... The, and that's, you know, call that second enlightenment cognition and so on. So that second enlightenment cognition no longer needs these implanted uh, uh, predispositions protected by the sacred that are embedded in religious uh, and contemplative traditions and so on. It no longer needs them because it can think through uh, from first principles the evolutionary processes that in the past uh, you know, shape those predispositions. Mm -hmm. so, so it can do what, you know, so it can it can kill God but retain all the wisdom. 
Because mm. the Nazis don't understand the wisdom. It mm. can think independently. Um, you know, it has a science. It'll have a science of of that which you know wisdom dealt with before, and, and that so it'll be able to derive from first principles. So, so imagine if so, just to try and have a more concrete example. Um, imagine a tribal society in which the members of the tribe have second enlightenment cognition. Uh, and so they have the capacity to sit down and say, okay, we, we see we're embedded in this evolutionary process where, where we're competing with other tribes and that, that mm. competition with other tribes leads to warfare uh, and so on. How do we need to organise ourselves? Uh, how do we need to behave? Uh, you know, what, uh, what should be our, our, what should we value and what should be our goals? so that we survive and thrive in competition with those other tribes and so on. Mm -hmm. So they would work out from first principles, uh, you know, how they need to organise themselves and they would be far more effective than, than waiting for evolution to, to mm -hmm. go through the trial and error process um, of, in effect, deciding, you know, how they should be organised. They could work out from first principles. So. We're imagining that you know these tribal members have that cognitive capacity. We're now on the verge, or if, if we're to you know survive our existential threats, we're on the verge of developing that capacity now and being able to, to understand cognitively how we need to reorganise ourselves and how you set up a global society that's that's highly evolvable in evolutionary terms. And as we've discussed before, you know that entails. Uh, maximum diversity, mm -hmm. uh, greater diversity, just just as our body, you know, yes, it's, yes. It's, well. yeah, it, it's a it's an explosion of diversity that we'll get with a global society, not a not the ball, not the not the totalitarian uh, centrally controlled society. But you only see that you only see that that's what it leads to. That you need you need a, you need a world society. In which the resources, first and foremost, of that society are used to ensure that every individual within the society develops develops their potential to the greatest extent, their cognitive, social, emotional um, uh, capacities. Because the evolvability of the global society, which is what you need to maximise, you know, mm -hmm. for the next evolutionary steps beyond that, depend upon you know the the realising the potential of of the most limited resource of all for the global society, which is the individual components, the individual humans that, and processes that make up uh, the global so, society. So, so um, thank you for re-articulating that, that, uh, that framework. I see you've mentioned practices for waking up, and then you've meant that, that we also need the science the cognitive science for articulating this framework and what should be done, but what are the practices that would help turn that theory into concrete, you know, identities and communities? Are, like, are there are they practices where people are starting to access collective intelligence uh, uh, the, of distributed cognition? They're starting to realize uh, the the power of that, you know, dialectical dialogical practices. Uh, are, are these practices that would go, go in hand in hand? With with the, the with the waking up and with the cognitive science to get so people get a direct sense of what it would be like uh, to participate in the 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 I, I don't know what to call it the super organism or something are those the kinds of practices also that would be important? Um, well, look, looking at waking up first, just to give an example of uh, yeah, of of having a, a cognitive science understanding of waking up. And then using that cognitive science understanding yeah, yeah, yeah. of practices. So the key thing from the evolutionary perspective is obviously not waking up on the med meditation couch. Yes. It's about waking up in the midst of ordinary life. Mm. Uh, so that's that's where having the goal, you know, clear and unequivocal is essential to developing technologies. Uh, sure. sure. Once, so how do you wake up in the midst of ordinary life? Um, are there practices, you know, already you know, yeah, that are emerging. There are arguably, you know, the great Armenian systems thinker, uh, George Gurdjieff, 
you know, 100 years ago, yeah. started off doing what I'm talking about. He, 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 plundered, he plundered the religious and uh, conclave traditions that he could find in his wandering around Tibet, you know, and India and Persia and so on. Mm. He plundered them. As he said, he stole and, and his, mm. uh, he stole their, the essences of their practices and bound it together to form, you know, a new constellation of practices that were specifically designed to uh, lead to waking up in the midst of ordinary life. Mm. So he did meditation on the couch or whatever. He, um, and and uh, you, you will, I'm sure you'll easily see the, you know, the, the, the um, parallels with, with what you're promoting and what Goethe said, but basically waking up in the midst of ordinary life, uh, he, 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 what he was trying to promote was subject permanence mm. in the midst of life. So in other words, you're the, you, you, you develop a real eye, you develop uh, the ability for your subject to, make, to move through the world uh, undistracted by uh, by you know what's going on, what you're, what's interacting with you, and so on. Uh, but it's a highly dynamic process in which mm. you're going you're going emotions and predispositions and thoughts arising, but you're not embedded in them. You have psychological distance from them, so you're in this poised poised state. So the kind of practice you know he talked about self remembering, which is basically where you retain part of your attention on your attention as you're moving through the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that part of, the other part of your attention is on your, you know, your bodily field, yeah. and then the other is on the environment in general. Uh, and if you can move through the world like that, you're in a poised state. You're in, you're actually in a poised state where you're not your attention is no longer embedded in thinking uh, and reacting emotionally to circumstances. Uh, that's where the subject permanence comes in. You're you're aware mm -hmm. that you're aware, and you can. You're in a poised state where you can go with any uh, any set of thinking that that you decide to. You can go with any emotion. You you can act on it if you want to, but you've got the choice. Mm -hmm. So you're in effect can choice and choose whether to be bound by your existing likes and dislikes. You can move at right angles to your existing predispositions and so on. So that's basically his practice, and, and you know, there's various ways you can scaffold that capacity because it's not a, you know, it's, it's very simple in principle and it's very easy to get a glimpse of, but to actually be able to do it in the midst of ordinary life. Mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, you know, when I worked as a government policy advisor, you know, in meetings, I would practice being awake, having subject permits during the, the meeting. And the first thing you notice is that everyone else in the meeting is going off to sleep. You know, mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now to sleep and so on, and you know, it's, it's and it's a superpower if you can be awake when everyone else is asleep, then mm, right, uh, you can achieve whatever goals you are, good or uh, whatever goals you have, good or bad. So, anyway, coming now to uh, the cognitive science model of that, what, what is this awakening? You know, what's the cognitive science mm. model of awakening? And that's you know, something I've worked on and published about, uh, but it's very hard to, you know, to. Uh, to, to get acceptance of it, um, given that you know the most uh, scientists don't have experience of what you're pointing to, so the mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, that you know you is meaningless to them. But in any event, the the cognitive science model that uh, that I've developed, you know, basically the central point of it is this: that that consciousness uh, is very narrow in bed with it's serial and it's slow. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can't listen to two conversations. If you're in a party or whatever, you can't listen to two conversations at once. Mm -hmm. You listen to one and, and the other, you know, is not in your attention. Uh, if you think deeply about something when you're moving through the world, you'll be the absent-minded professor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you'll, the rest of the world disappears if you're in uh, mm -hmm. deep. You know, there's no subject permanence. You're not, you're not awake. Um, so there, there's numerous, numerous examples of this limited bandwidth, this limited capacity, this slowness and serial nature, and it's well established. It's, you know, uh, starting with Miller's um, magic number seven plus or minus two, 
Yeah, yeah. there's a limit. Things you can keep working memory at any one time. Um, so, so that hence sleep. So it immediately then leads that that's a, that leads to a cognitive science understanding or model of sleep. Sleep is when you're embedded in something that takes up the limited bandwidth of, of consciousness and and excludes other things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, dem it's, it leads immediately to an understanding of the fall, the fall uh, and the fact that we're at a stage in human evolution where our consciousness is, is colonised by, uh, taken over by thinking, by proposition mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so, so we're incessantly thinking. Where you know the monkey mind and so on, but where it's not the monkey mind you observe in meditation. It's, it's the monkey mind is you. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. If you don't psychological distance from the, the the thinking process, so so waking up is being able to still the you know the the thinking mind uh, and being in this poised state of open awareness uh, where you can maintain open awareness despite events going on around you, uh, but you're fully aware of those events. In fact, in fact, you're more aware of those events than a, a sleeping human being. Mm -hmm. uh, you're more aware of them, and you're uh, able to able to respond to them in with all your you know learned capacities and so on. And that's arguably that's what being in the zone is. Being in the zone is. Um, is when you've, you've still the mind, uh, you're in absolutely open awareness, your automatic, uh, you know, learned capacities, your motor programs and so on uh, are being evoked by the circumstances around you, so you act extraordinarily skillfully and so on, but mm -hmm. you've got the subject permanence. Um, it's quite different to the, the flow state, um, which is, which also still, you know, owes its, you know, if the, its interestingness to the fact that it stills the, the thinking mind, but it does it through absorption. So the, the classic examples of the flow state that chicks and mentally, uh, you know, identified and, and define and recognize the essence of, uh, are like the playing computer games um, mm -hmm. or the mountain climbing mathematicians. Mm -hmm. and a very high proportion of mathematicians, uh, academic mathematicians, are, yeah, their hobby is mountain climbing. Um, mm -hmm. Mountain climbing instills their, you know, their hyperactive thinking mind. You, you need something very serious. Yeah, Just, yeah. You, you and and chicks and mentalities play with the, uh, you know, if you need a sequence of challenges that are not too easy to be boring and not too difficult is to be frustrating. Mm -hmm. It puts you in the flow, but it's not the it's not waking up. Being in the flow is not waking up. It's it's not being it's it's the the opposite of waking up. The you know the 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 the, the, the guys who, who have you know sat down on a computer and played a computer game for four days until they drop dead mm -hmm. because they don't drink water. They don't you know they're totally absorbed in the game. They're absolutely in flow. Mm -hmm. In a state that's enjoyable to them, uh, but it's clearly pathological. You know, it's clearly, it's clearly mm -hmm. not an open, broad, poised uh, state. And and it, and equally, as as I think Ian McGilchrist McGilch pointed out in your discussion with him, um, it's not that useful in the sense that you know the conditions for flow, you know, the, the sequence of tasks, not too difficult, not too easy. Uh, doesn't exist, you know, you need that to be in the flow. Uh, so, so I'm sure that I, I would suspect that some of the circumstances that you refer to where you're, you know, and others refer to as being in the flow, it's in actual fact, it's the open uh, focus waking up that they're actually in, not, not the absorbed flow state. Uh, what's, what's the primary phenomenological difference? Uh, that that the absorption concentration characterizes the flow state. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, climbing, mountain climbing, looking for the next handhold, the next handhold. Yeah. So, uh, while you could do that, you could do that 
in the zone, which is the waking up state, which is where you're not absorbed in the, you've in effect surrendered. Uh, you're, sur you're, you're surrendered psychologically and your body will do the, will find the next handhold and so on. Uh, but your awareness is broad, absolutely broad. You're, so the you know, example is, <clears throat> there's an example that uh, is given, uh, not specifically in the terms I've given, but a phenomenon that's, that relates to this is the F1 uh, driver driving down the main straight with the grandstands on either side. You know, mm. if, if a person halfway up in the stands opens their umbrella, he will see it. Mm. I mean, I haven't driven down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is recorded. So the so that's the difference between an open focus and a, and a narrowly focused thing. So Muhammad Ali, when he uh, in that extraordinary documentary, "We Were Kings," uh, about the rumble in the jungle, uh, the uh, where he's fighting George Foreman. And they're interviewing him, and they, you know, the interviewer says, "Look, George Foreman's a beast. You know, he's much mm. bigger than, much as incredible. No one can beat him. He's un, indefeatable. And aren't you scared to death? You know, getting in the ring with him?" And Muhammad Ali says, "Well, he said, yeah, if if Muhammad Ali was getting in the ring uh, with him, he'd be scared to death. Um, but I'm not. But Muhammad Ali doesn't get in the ring with him. He said, Allah gets in the ring with him. I." Mm. I, it's, I surrendered to Allah. We well, didn't use the word surrender, but, but uh, you know, it's Allah in the ring with him who's, who's guiding his action. So he's in a surrendered state, which is an open focus state, as opposed to a you know concentrated state. So it's the difference between constant. It's broadly comes. It basically comes down to the difference between a concentrated meditation versus an open focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're moving through ordinary life. Uh, in most circumstances, then the it's the open focus. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, un, it, another way, another term to use is unloaded consciousness. Mm -hmm. So consciousness narrow bandwidth. So you need to unload consciousness uh, so that it's not embedded in and narrowly focused, uh, and so on. So yeah, I would say uh, that's the main difference. But yeah. But but you said in the open focus, you still have that sense of at one minute with the environment, like your actions are right fitted still. Um, like so that one of the characteristics of the Csikszentmihalyi flow state is right that you you know the 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 you're you're, you're sparring and the punch comes and and you do the correct block and you find the opening, like, like that kind of virtuosity is that still present in the open state? Um, Absolutely. So so. Say tennis players when I hear when I hear their descriptions of being in the zone, or the F1 driver going down the main straight, uh, you know they and they're in. Then when I hear the tennis players talk, they're in the open focus, so they they're aware of their body, uh, they're aware of uh, you know of of serving of uh, you know moving around the court and so on. But, the, but they're not embedded in the decisions. Uh, right. Yeah. So, that, sounds, so a, that sounds like a distinction that I, I've been making between what I call hot flow and cold flow or cool flow. Uh, so the hot flow is that very, and it brings with it that tremendous sort of metabolic fire uh, and, and you're really highly focused where cool flow, which I get from sort of the jazz world is, no, no, you have this, I get into that state where I'm lecturing, where I'm aware of all of the students and I'm aware of the material. Like it's, it's, and it doesn't have that. It has a different, yeah, that's why I use the difference between hot and cool uh, to try and describe it. That's, that's well, that's because I, I have no doubt, you know, in watching your videos carefully, that you're, that you're often experiencing what I call the, you know, the waking up. Right. The open, right. I get that. Yes. Yeah. So the so for example in your lecture theatre, uh, you see all the students. If one of the students at the back raised an umbrella, yes, you know, you, yeah, 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 you, you yes. can see it. If you're mountain climbing and you're actually you know embedded in the mountain climbing, you know you don't know you don't see anything else that's going on around you. Right. So there's 
the, the state to be cultivated, and this comes back to, you know, you, it's necessary to have clear goals uh, about what the technologies are, are trying to scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the state that's awakening in the midst of ordinary life is the open state, not, not, the, not the flow state. Mm. So I'm sure you're doing that. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm, hearing you talk, you're awakening in the midst of ordinary life mm. you know, in a number of circumstances and so on. Um, but the, the, but you, you often call it flow. Well, I, I don't think it is the chicks and mentally flow mm. um, at all. It's, and, I, and I looked at that in detail when I ran a, uh, co-organised a, a workshop at the Towards the Science of Consciousness uh, conference in Hong Kong in 2010 or 11 it was, um, where we, this workshop was looking at meaningful media. And I did some blog posts, posts and there what I looked at was how, was how, because, uh, you know, had, had a scaffolding method for scaff scaffolding the, the open waking up mm. uh, mode uh, by using uh, uh, what I call an engineered flow, flow state. Mm. So the concept, the concept was this, you can design a computer game uh, that initially you know, produces flow. Mm. And that, that sort of drags you into the, you know, mm. propel into the engages you and so on. And, but then the flow state can lead to a series of tasks that then open up the awareness. Right, 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 right. I get that. I get that. That really, I get that. I, I really resonate with just that move you made. Um, right. That's very cool. And and that con yeah, that con that's a con that's the kind of new practice you're proposing as one of the kinds of things that we would need to be doing. That you we, we could use technology and the psychology to get maybe start people in the flow state and then open up the scope um, and, and, and the sense of presence in the flow state uh, to be the, what you're calling the open state. Am I understanding the proposal correctly? Yeah, exactly, precisely. So, so the yeah, and so you end up with technologies that are far more effective at developing the capacities uh, that are wanted for evolution to personify mm -hmm. the um, and and be a little relationship uh, unless you've got the underlying cognitive science theory mm -hmm. where you can see you know, you have, you have a cognitive science theory that unifies, you know, the, the contemplative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you can see how they, how they have the effects they have. And the effects they have have nothing to do with their stories. Yeah, and the yeah. Natural stuff and everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. And, and to, do, to do that, to make that move, to, you know, to develop a cognitive science understanding and then to use that to develop new, you know, new scaffolding, that's more effective and, and tuned and shaped and so on. To do that, you you have to mess with the sacred. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 So, because because the sacred and reverence, you know, are part of the from a cognitive science perspective, they're part of the. They don't. They don't. They don't need to protect from meddling. You yeah. Know, these passed down. Yeah. Uh, that would be meddled with by the ignorant and dissipated and and so on, if, if they weren't protected by the, you know, the sacred. Not only, so it's not only just protecting, but it's also, it helps produce a state that's conducive to the goals of those mm -hmm. practices. Mm -hmm. You know, reverence, rituals, um, you know, rituals can put you in a, in a, in either, uh, you know, a flow state or the open Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, rituals are the greatest bullshitting devices. Mm -hmm. uh, to use your terminology, right? Uh, again, that I've picked up from my stalking. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the the uh, so bull, bullshit. The greater you know, in the first phase of the three-step evolutionary transition, I'm talking about evolution needs to implant in individuals. You know, beliefs and moral principles uh, that they can't change, that they can't meddle with, that they can't question, and that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, 
Um, and yeah, I've lost my train of thought there, John. Well, uh, you were moving towards the train of thought that, right, w w and that that might be embedded in ritual, but we could reappropriate yeah. the machine uh, that's in ritual, yeah. and and get something that's sort of trans ritual. It's like it it, it captures the functionality of ritual. But doesn't we're not bound at a, at a level of ignorance. We're bound at a level of knowledge and wisdom. I think that's what you were going to propose. Yes, you you haven't lost my train of thought at all. It's, <laughs> it's right. only only I who have. So um, yeah, so ritual as a bullshitting device, you know, because because there's been thousands upon thousands of religions in human history, mm -hmm. you know, the tribal level and so on, and and evolution needed a device. That uh, that convinced individuals that those there was truth mm -hmm. and important significance in those um, whatever story, those thousands of different stories, and and you know the device of ritual, which can put you into these transformed states. Uh, the the stories ascribe that state, which mm -hmm. is startling and you know alluring and seems significant to the participants in the ritual. The the story, you know, ascribes that state to the truth mm -hmm. of the, of the their religious beliefs and whatever mm -hmm. suit it is, mm -hmm. you know, they're describing and so on. So um so ritual uh so rituals can be misused and so on, but again they become a uh you know a possible technology. Yes. Uh, yes. That you understand in cognitive science terms, and you can play with, and so on. Yeah, I, I distinguish, you know, the, the the technologies from the the or the practices from the contemplative and spiritual traditions that I've found less useful uh, uh, are those that aren't portable. Uh, mm. So the because if if your goal is waking up in the midst of ordinary life. Mm. Uh, as opposed to doing it in a darkened room to minimise distractions and make it easier to mm -hmm. so on, then uh, then you need practices that are portable. So so to take around with you, you know, rituals and so on is yes. um, portable. So you you need you know you need to use your cognitive science to see you know the uh, a way of uh, waking up, and there's there's myriads of ways of waking up. Uh, a school of self-knowledge that I went to once used to say that everyone's hobbies, uh, that what attracts people to them is love of the self. Mm. Uh, and by self, they meant the Advaita Vedanta self, which is the... Atman. The, yeah. The, basically the awakened state when you experience it. And they said that 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 whatever your hobby is, if you really look it down, it's, it's like mountain climbing for mm. the mathematicians. It... Um, it's still, it's your hobby stills the mind and makes you aware of your awareness. And that's why, you know, you're attracted to the hobby. And, you know, I looked at my, my obsession through my younger life as fishing. Mm. And uh, fishing is very, it's very, uh, yes. you know, very meditative, uh, by concentration meditation. Um, the, the great sporting events, sporting events, why are human beings attracted to sport? And it's, mm. um, it's because things happen in sport that are, are ineffable. They're ineffable. They can't be understood propositionally. Mm. They still have a propositional mind. So, so when the crowd at the the Melbourne, the great Melbourne cricket ground down the road from me here are watching an AFL match and they gasp, they gasp. You know, there's a, a gasp collectively amongst a hundred thousand people, and they are waking up mm. from a that's that's the attraction of it and so on um so you need port portable methods so right i was going to say you want rituals that portable you're calling portable they're they're transferable to many different domains and many different uh dimensions of of of, of a lived life they don't get locked into a particular location or a particular setting or context they're transcontextual in that manner and ideally they're, they're transportable on the individual level you're so right. the individual needs so so there's and 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 some are more portable for 
ordinary life than others. Yeah. So, for example, you know, I've never taken to the, you know, the given attention to the sensations of the breath. Um, you know, that is partly absorptive for me. So, so the awareness of awareness is which you use in your meta. Mm -hmm. The awareness of the awareness can be, you know, the centre of everything, which is mm -hmm. the memory of yourself. Awareness, awareness, expanding awareness out, and then maintaining that as you. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Nothing more portable than that. Uh, the because because that's that's this. So the, the just moving back to the cognitive science model quickly. Um, the cognitive science model that uh, explains this, as I said, is. You know, consciousness is very narrow bandwidth, uh, and you need to clear the, the bandwidth to be uh, openly aware, and also to have to have things, conscious experiences go through to your, to your unconscious mind, which is a critical part of this, because the the um, you mentioned at one point that you know the the uh, the next, the next stage in development is is to be able to manage your four P's, yes. properly, participatory, yeah. and so on. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's an, a, another level to which those are object. Mm. So, so critical to that development, and this get comes to you know starts to enter the develop, how do you develop the higher cognitive capacities? Critical to it is making what was part of your subject. Uh, and that you're unaware of that had you rather than you had it mm -hmm. Make, making that object to this new higher level awareness right 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 when it is object that you can play with it you can manage it you know it's it's almost the dialectical it's more complex than the dialectical but the dialectical thesis and antithesis mm -hmm. uh, you need the synthesis from a higher level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not just oppositional processing which can occur at the thesis and antithesis, um, and and you know because that's unlikely to settle in the yeah. optimal thing. You need the higher level to which that is object that can manage it and right. uh, you know and some and integrate integrate the thesis and the antithesis. Um, so coming back to the cognitive science model. Uh, Consciousness is very narrow. We need to, you know, uh, make sure it's unloaded to have open awareness and wake up in the midst of ordinary life. How do you do that? Uh, what is it about, you know, placing attention on sensations of the breath or sensations of touching the table or, mm -hmm. uh, or placing attention on attention or feeling your body, you know, as a, as a whole, as, as, you know, tends to work particularly when you're around um, you know, in, in martial arts or whatever. Uh, so what is it about that that, that stills the thinking mind that uh, clears, you know, the, the narrow bandwidth of consciousness and enables you to wake up? Um, and arguably it's the, uh, that you, what, what you're basically doing, building this muscle, uh, is giving attention to something that doesn't evoke thoughts it's got to be uh you you give bare attention to things so mm -hmm. i saw in one of your videos you were uh, describing that that it's you know when you're observing monkey mind or your emotions or whatever you you're not giving attention to the content mm -hmm. or giving attention to just the fact and, and naming it how, helps that giving bare attention. So, so what actually is going on in cognitive science terms, arguably, mm -hmm. is you're giving bare attention, you're giving attention to things as object, you're not embedded in them, you're not, you know, you're not embedded in the thinking, you're seeing the thinking from the outside. Uh, and again, this is, it's critical to understand that in order to see how you can scaffold this higher level of management um, that it, that can uh, manage the four P's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For example, in, in your terminology, in terms of the salience landscape, 
mm. manage, manage the sailings landscape so that it no longer uh, is informed by and constrained by your the predispositions and salience in right. the end from your evolutionary past, socialization, and culturation, and so on, and enables you to revise your uh, say, you know, choose your likes and dislikes, mm. revise, revise your salience landscape so that it is now aligned with the demands of the future evolution, not the demands of past evolution. Mm -hmm. I see that. Yeah, that sounds very similar to uh, one of the cardinal virtues, Sofreson, where you're you go, you're you no longer doing kratia, you're no longer sort of regulating yourself. Instead, things are cleared out, and you're constantly tempted by the good rather than being trying to overcome uh, your, your past. Like you open up into this, uh, 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 you're constantly being, like I said, drawn towards the good, drawn to rather than um, constantly being tempted by what is distracting or self destructive or self deceptive. And it sounds like you're uh, proposing something that's very analogous. Uh, well, you, and, become, you become transparent to these predispositions, these emotional impulses, and yeah. so on. So, you, so for the first time, rather than just mouthing the, the platitude of turning the other cheek, you actually can turn the other cheek, yes. not, by, not by suppressing yes. you know, the, uh, yeah. the slice, but by being transparent to it. By yeah. not occupying and contracting down, yes. no longer tracks down your consciousness. The it, the pain flows through you, and yeah. you know, one image, and it's a terrible image, but one image of you know the point you want to reach up with, reach to reach at when you change when you you know you manage your intentionally informed by an evolutionary perspective of the uh, of your salience landscape. The image is to me is the uh, uh, the Buddha smart, you know, who sets himself on fire outside the American Embassy yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah, and he he wouldn't he would have felt all the pain. He wasn't repressing it, but no. the pain sensation it would have been pure sensation. Yeah. It therefore didn't trigger, you know, the the tensing, the screaming, yeah. and so on. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, that's a very profound state. Well, John, this has been uh, excellent, as the previous uh, two have been. We got a lot deeper into your thinking uh, today, and um, I was uh, intentionally trying to give you lots of space to talk um, uh, uh, so that we uh, could get a, a, a deeper sense. And there was some really cool, uh, this in particular, this distinction between flow and the open state or hot flow and uh, cool flow. I think that that's really, really interesting and really thought provoking. And that that uh, open state, the cool flow, can enable us uh, to move to the, the the kind of perspective and cognitive capacity we need in order to orient properly towards the future. I think that's a very profound um, proposal. Uh, but I like to give people that are on my show. Uh, oh, I'm thanking you, but I like to give people on my show, and you know this, the the sort of last word. You know, it doesn't have to be summative or cumulative. Just the last thing you want to leave uh the viewers with uh you know just just to be provocative again uh, which is in my archetype um i talk about portability and uh and the portability has to be portable with the individual and that's one of the limitations of these collective processes mm -hmm. uh, so like ritual also the the collective presencing processes Mm -hmm. um, you can't take around with you the sangha. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so to be awake in the midst of ordinary life, you know, for me in my my work, you know, to be awake during meetings, uh, awake during discussions, awake and so on, then I have to be able to enter that state on my own and so on. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, John, it's been fantastic as it always has been and it's been an absolute pleasure stalking you in preparation. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, John.